afternoon, everybody. Okay. Sleepy after lunch, right? Although I can't see you guys. I'm not wearing my specs, and this is too much, too bright on my face. But um, yeah, so I'll begin. A journey through the green bit. I mean, it almost sounds like a beginning of a Lord of the Rings Hobbit movie, <laughs> right? But yes, I will take you to a long, long time ago, in a far, far away forest, <laughs> lived me, my dad, my mother, and my brother with our baby elephant, Lakshmi. <laughs> no, but on a serious note, we were very privileged because of my dad's profession to be exposed to some of the most pristine forests of the country, some of the most beautiful ecosystems that exist on the planet. We spent our birthdays like this with the elephants of the camp. We rescued plenty of animals, relocated them, grew up. Every summer holiday was in a national park, a wildlife sanctuary. Wildlife photography was a part of it. Exposure to different ecosystems, from the Himalayas to the rainforests of the south, western Ghats, northeast, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So as a family, we traveled through all this. And the rescuing continued in later years of life, all rehabilitated and doing well. So honestly, it's just this privilege that let us have this exposure to everything around us. But unfortunately, we are also in an era of mass extinction of species. What does this mean? Every three hours, one species is being pushed towards extinction. How? How is this happening? Of course, you all know the buzzwords of these days, climate change, global warming, land pollution, air pollution, water pollution, at the base of it all, thought pollution, right? Cause of it all. So but you might end up saying, so what? So what if this beetle in this picture goes away from the planet? You might not have even seen it, right? Or the flower disappears forever. But Paul Ehrlich, an ecologist, he has a theory, a rivet theory. He says that the planet can be compared to an aeroplane. If one rivet or a species falls off, nothing's going to happen. The plane will still continue moving. Another one falls off, and yet another, and one more. And you never know when the plane is going to crash. That's the case with our planet these days. So this interconnectedness between all living beings, between every species on this planet, is what makes us what we are. What gives me the right to talk about it, right? An exposure to this while that I showed you just now, is that enough? Yeah. yeah. I will be happy to show some of my photographs, uh, which I have uh, in uh, over three decades of my career in forestry I've taken. Next, please. Next. Next. Okay. India, I'm sure you are aware, is the only country in the world which has wild population of both a tiger and a lion. One of the rare most and most endangered primates on planet Earth from the Western Ghats, the lion-tailed macaque. Apes we have in Eastern Himalaya, lesser ape, Hulu Gibbon. This is the largest of all the rhinoceros in the world. I am sure, you know, I've been to interacting with people like you, well-informed intellectuals. Uh, you all know, I'm sure, about the status of our animals in this country. However, if I ask you, can you name three critically endangered plants, uh, plants of this mega biodiversity country. I don't know how many of you can raise your hands. If I ask you, how many species of trees are there in India? I wonder any one of you know. Forget about that. I'm not insulting. This is how it is. When it comes to information about plants, it's abysmally low. If I ask you, can you identify 15 tree species of India, including a banana, which is not a true tree, and a goa, which is not from India, not many raise their hands. 
Why I say this is every three species of plants that we see today in the current scenario, one is being pushed towards extinction. Reasons are obvious, habitat degradation, destruction of habitat, but one thing I would like to emphasize is, ha, who doesn't know, recognize a gulmohar tree? I'm yet to come across one person who doesn't recognize a gulmohar. It's a, not a timber tree, bad fuel wood. This big a fruit, monkeys don't eat it. If it has medicinal value, go to Madagascar to figure it out. The flowers, the flamboyant tree has wonderful flowers but doesn't have much nectar in it. Spreads a disease, fungal disease, not many of us know. It happens to be the most numerous tree of India today. You don't have to make any research to assess this and come to this conclusion. The jacar and the, uh, the kaijalia pinnata, pakyu akar in Delhi, there are so many of them. The big pendulous fruit, if it falls on your car, it makes a big dent on it. The monkeys don't eat the fruit as well. While a large number of the plants that we are, you know, we had been, the heritage of India is that, you know, our understanding of the plants around us, a large number of them are dying out. Sorry. So, after post uh, superannuation, I was privileged to, you know, be welcomed into a community which has 1,600 acres of uh, uh, land. And I was uh, one of the lead members to green this. We planted a large number of uh, plants for, of this Deccan Plateau. Quite a number of them are economically, ecologically important, like there is a frankincense. There are two species of Indian frankincense. There is a redwood of India. There is a satinwood of India. All are endangered, but they are very hardy. We could easily grow them. After a year or so, a visionary who guides us all in Kanar Chantibanam, he said uh, that we should have a rainforest there. Uh, 30 odd years of uh, forest service and I come from Western Ghats, hail from Western Ghats. I simply said, oh no sir, that, uh, that is not a possibility. Again he asked me, after four or five days, I said that is not a possibility. Third time he said, we should have an Amazon forest here. A person, I couldn't say no, not believing that one plant would survive. What a rainforest is, 100 feet canopy, that is 10 story building tall trees make a canopy. There are species called emergent species, 150 feet, 180 feet tall they grow. They flower, the fruit, the bats, the birds, the squirrel seed, the seeds, the fruits and then the seed falls. The sapling finds in itself in a dark, damp, and a humid place. And many of them are never exposed to a direct sunlight. Such species, such fragile plants, in a big number we planted. I happened to be a head of an academy. I had my, my shishyas who were in key positions. I could gather them. A large number of species. We made a rainforest a possibility in a dry land eco ecosystem. Uh, infertile soil, uh, you know, many things. And we could really make swaths of rainforests in semi arid landscape. <laughs> A thing genuinely I did not believe happened. In retrospect, I wonder is it because I had the necessary skill sets, the knowledge? I really wonder. Knowledge and skill sets, are, skill sets are enough to make this kind of a thing. Without, they, you, there are rainforests in Kew Gardens in America, huge structures, you know, and uh, of, uh, made of uh, concrete, cement, steel, glass, and then computer modulated uh, micro ecosystem. In the open space, we could create space of land, how we said. So, what he uh, is referring to here. Science now validates and terms it as consciousness. And it says that plants have it too. Plants are also now categorized as sentient beings. Animals, of course, are. 
And science is now awakening to this concept of expansion of this consciousness. Consciousness, as science defines, is a connect to your own self. And they also talk about maybe there's an expansion of this consciousness that can include every other being. But how do we get to this expansion? I didn't plan it at all. I was in uh, Mumbai, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, uh, foolishness of youth or uh, whatever it is. I said if I don't, I resign, I mean I discontinued. I said if I don't crack this forest service exam, no one else will. I cracked it. Then I also, you know, as a backup plan, I had civil services exam. I was invited for uh, the interview. Actually, trust me, I prayed to God. Don't give me that job. It's far better than a forest officer's job. But I want to be a forest officer. I didn't make to civil services. But I also foolish enough not to opt for my state. I had good merit. I landed in Manipur. A very difficult place. I got rotted, pulverized, painful. Terrible. Uh, you know, if a person will come, this hill range is mine. Sets fire on it for a festival of grains, a, a place where speciation occurred. Two important families, Gingibaresi and Rutesi. Ginger and lemon evolved there in that place. No job satisfaction. There was insurgency then. Terrible. Many years. Then the question came, who am I? Why am I? That's not just the thing. Honestly speaking, I was a despicable fellow. I didn't like me, myself. You know, passionate, anxiety, short-tempered, horrible. <laughs> so I said, OK, I have to change. And I had lots of time in that place. Read a lot, a whole lot about religions across the world, you know, worshiping of the unknown God, things like that fellow who I then thought more foolish than me inspired me. I was struggling with my existential problem. Here is a fellow looking at the pain of others, runs away from his life, from his wife, from his child, from his kingdom, gets into forest and they said he meditated and comes back as an enlightened one, now worshipped as God. So I said if he could do it, I should. <laughs> Took me 14 years to find an appropriate path. Now it is almost 30 years that I am treading on a path. I meditate. And uh, trust me, I'm a nice fellow. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was hard hearted. Uh, my mother used to call us all. We were seven brothers, no sister. Rakshasas, you know, I was one. Find kindness, compassion, mercy, sharing, caring, and connect with fellow human beings and with plants, insects, a possibility. It has become my possibility. And I should say, with all humility. Thank you. And I guess what he is trying to say is that he became less violent <laughs> <laughs> towards not only himself and other fellow human beings, but also to the environment and everything around him. My journey was not as uh, tough or interesting, I would say. <laughs> but after I finished my PhD in 2019, I thought I'll spend a couple of months where he was um, and you know have fun with him before I go for my postdoc. And I came to this place. And I stayed back for three years. <laughs> I was involved with the greening that happened on campus, the ex situ conservation project. And this combination of uh, a journey of refinement, inner refinement, along with an exposure to the greening, I think that made this connect that we are talking about to everything around us a reality for me. I mean, of course, I have to add here that where I'm working right now, climate change education also, it it emphasizes that academic knowledge is not enough. We have to have an enhancement of cognitive functions and also competencies such as empathy, compassion, kindness, in order to have a full flourishing of human beings that can be achieved. So this, these stories that we are sharing today, it might seem like pocket stories, but not really. I mean, like the rainforest that is there at the uh, place that he lives right now, it's regenerating by itself, naturally. 
which is an achievement for the ecosystem. These kind of procedures or these, uh, these journeys, they also sustain you in every which way possible, let you regenerate. And this refinement leads you to purity, which then weaves this connect, weaves the bridge to everything around you, and that builds in your destiny. Purity that weaves the destiny. Thank you. Thank you.